Little did we know, Jim, that the tumult had just begun. So the next day is Pentecost Sunday, and my eyes roll back in my head again, and I die again and again and again. My soul left my body, and I watched him work on me, and I was a total peace of looking at myself, recognizing the body from the soul's perspective. Then this glorious white light came. It was more intense than the, than the sun. God gave us words to try it in our finite intellect to, to articulate or explain our reason and our thoughts, but you cannot describe God. Hey, I'm Jim Havens. Good to meet you. I host a radio show called The Simple Truth, where we pursue the good, true, and beautiful and proclaim the life-giving reality of Jesus and his Catholic Church. Stick around. If you like it, give it a thumbs up and let us know what you think in the comments below. Uh, the book is Faith Understood, An Ordinary Man's Journey to the Presence of God. This is a very powerful personal testimony that you're going to hear today. Paul and Beth Zuccarelli, welcome to The Simple Truth. Thank you for being with us today. How are you? Oh, Jim, it's a pleasure. Thank, thank you so much for having us. Uh, begin with the beginning. Let's start with childhood. Anything that you can share on what your early life was like, your family, the, the culture that you grew up in? Sure. Great question. Um, I am a product of a very poorly catechized family. And my mother was Protestant and my dad was Catholic. And I was caught between Vatican I and Vatican II. Born in 1959, so I went from, okay, it's, everything's in Latin to what are we doing? And uh, was just told, just be quiet. This is what we do. Go to church or you're going to hell. It was a lot of guilt-based uh, belief system without any explanation. It's just that that's what we do. So we practiced Catholicism even though mom was a Protestant. I got my love of the Bible from my grandmother, Lillian, on my mother's side who lived with us. Mom was an only child because uh, her husband had died when my mother was four, and she never remarried. So Lillian would sit there and read her Bible, and, and as a little boy, I'd walk by her room, and this woman had such peace and grace to her because she was engulfed in the Bible all the time. So here I am uh, in western New York living uh, near uh, the north side. I was in fourth grade in a public school, public school 81, and a math teacher, Jim, asked me to stay after school. And I didn't know what it was about, but I loved math. Her name was Mrs. Pryor. You know how you have those foundational moments in your life that uh, mm -hmm. you don't realize them until later? And she asked me to stay after, and she asked me, she says, Paul, I see something special in you. I think the Lord's going to do great things in your life. And I'm like 10 years old. And she asked me if I was saved, if I was born of the Spirit. And I'm like, huh? And she pulls out John chapter 3, and she begins to read me the story of Nicodemus. And again, I'm a fourth grade kid. <clears throat> And she gave me a prayer card and she said, I want you to get on your knees tonight and accept Jesus into your heart. And I want you to read this prayer to him. It'll change your life. You'll never live the same. So fast forward. I did it that night. I, re I really respected the teacher and didn't realize that that was, a, again, a foundation stone in my spiritual maturation. And then lo and behold, about three years later, my mother will get terminal cancer. And uh, she went to Roswell and they, she had breast cancer back in the early 70s. All they did was surgery. So they removed her breasts, her lymph nodes and all that. Then it metastasized across the mediastinum. And um, she's, um, uh, they told her to get her affairs in order. She was going to die. And mom was about 41, 42 at the time. And my mother desperately wanted to live because we had, uh, I have two, a brother and a sister. So there's three of us. And my mother, in desperation, went to the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary Catholic Church. That's when the charismatic movement was starting. And asked women to lay hands on her and pray for her. And she did that. She came home and she told the family, I felt this, this energy go through my core. I feel I've been healed by the wounds of Christ. I will never go back to a doctor again. Mom never went back to a doctor, praise be Jesus Christ. And she uh, lived to 83 didn't die of cancer. So I took my mother's healing gym for granted. I really did. Um, so mom moved out to Tucson, Arizona. And shortly thereafter, she told the family, look at if I die, I want to die like John the Baptist, like in the desert. I have a cousin there. And literally, we all moved to Tucson, except I stayed because Beth, my lovely wife, we were uh, dating and I was right at the cusp of college or no college. And um, so I decided to go to Canisius and stay back there. Uh, but as soon as we finished college, we moved to Tucson as well. Beth and I were blessed to be married in the same church that my mother was healed in. 
the Nativity of the Blessed Virgin Mary. So um, in Harris Hill, so that was another grace given to us. Um, And again, then after marriage, we came out this way uh, to the West Coast to be with mom, not knowing how long she'd live. And and she lived longer after a diagnosis from cancer than she did before. So again, uh, all by the power of Jesus Christ. But as far as my personal faith, again, I was a, I was probably your typical Catholic in the pew. You go to Mass, that's what you'd have to do. And it was more like the check the box Catholic, you know? And what was interesting from my perspective was having the foresight to love the Bible. I mean, of unfortunately, the Catholic Church, well, you don't need to know the Bible. The priest just reads that stuff to you every Sunday, or you can go to Bible school, but um, that's not what we Catholics do. So I was a little bit of an anomaly in that I loved the Word. I mean, I loved, I was immersed in the Word, Old Testament, New Testament. So from that perspective, um, I had a little bit, I believe, of a leg up, if you will. So we were ra- my wife was raising two kids. I wanted a traditional family. We didn't come for money. Um, and I was lost at age 28. Got all this responsibility and pressure. And I remember after Mass one day, I went up to the base of a mountain. I'm a mountain guy. I mean, I try to get as close to God as I can at the heights. <clears throat> I sat under a tree at age 28. I said, Lord, why do why am I here? Why do I exist? And I wrote a mission statement. And it never said what I do for a living. It just said, what's my role in life as a father, as a husband, as a son, as a brother? And it described myself serving other people, my community. <clears throat> and I stuck to that mission statement in my life. And it grounded me. When the guys wanted to go out for Monday night football, chicken wing stuff, now I have to go home to my family. I'm a family man. So it really helped me uh, stay focused. So I'm just rocking and rolling in life, man. I'm changing jobs, earning more money. And for some reason that only God knows, I became very successful, much more successful than I ever imagined. And as I became more successful, the world demanded more of me. So 40 hours became 60, became 70. I was on this like hamster wheel. And then as the, as the world consumed me, so to speak, even though we were charitable and I did a lot of nonprofit board work with children, especially, um, I was um, <clears throat> consumed by the world. And, uh, you know, your identity becomes your success. Now that I, when you hear what happened to me, I realized that, that was really a form of pride where uh, Jesus talks about, you know, the sower and the seed. There's pits, every four persons in one, everybody's in one of four categories. I was the guy in the third category. The word was in me, but the allure of riches and the anxieties of this life, as scripture says, choking me, I wasn't producing fruit. And God said, you know, everyone needs to get to the fourth uh, where you're producing fruit 30, 60, 100 fold. I wasn't there yet. I would go to church to make me feel good about myself. And I had kind of a vending machine Jesus approach. You know, I would pray and ask him for things when I needed it, what I needed and how I needed it as opposed to uh, gracious reverence and thanksgiving and supplication. As I was going through this phase in my life of just being overwhelmed with, with uh, a lot of stuff going on, my father dies suddenly, my best friend, came out of nowhere. And then my brother gets, my only brother gets hit by a car, survives 12 hours of trauma surgery, he's a complete paraplegic, but uh, he suffers a lot. And then I bought a business off a guy for a lot of money and uh, it was a personal service business, and he dies. I've got to keep all the clients. So I'm like, man, I don't control anything. I'm 40. But Paul just kept going through life. Um, and uh, when I was in my late 40s, I began having atrial fibrillation in my heart. My heart was out of rhythm, and they would say, well, he's, he's a hard-charging CEO. He's an executive, and he's just a lot of stress. And, you know, then they found I had a mitral valve prolapse. My mitral valve was leaking which causes an expansion of the atrium, which throws off your electrical. But, you know, Paul would just take medication and get his heart back, or he'd pray on it. If it didn't come back, I'd go in, I'd get cardioverted, which means electrically shocked, put you out, i get shocked. And Jim, I would just go right back into that big, bad world because that's that's what uh, affirmed me, if you will. Now the kids are older, life is good, our family's wonderful, and all of a sudden the kids are older and... uh, I'm in my early 50s, and I'm thinking, what about the next life? What about the next life? I would read my mission statement. I said, you know, I kind of did okay, I think. Um, and 
I would begin to take Beth to near-death experience movies. And it would kind of, uh, she'd go, why, why are you doing this? I said, I'm, I need to know. See, I'm an analytic guy, so I like to know knowledge. And I said, there's people that have seen heaven, hell, and purgatory. I want to see what they've seen. I want to know. I want to know if it exists. So I would go to the movies with her. I'd read the books from the neurosurgeons, the cardiologists. <laughs> I laugh now, Jim. Little, little did I know then. Looking back, my life makes perfect sense. I was being prepared spiritually for what was about to happen to me. I didn't understand at the time. I was blessed to take care of my mom as she passed, and then all of a sudden my health begins to rapidly fail. Um, I can't breathe right. I'm having a hard time walking and walking up hills. So I went to the cardiologist down in Tucson, and he said I was fine. Uh, he said, take some medicine. Your valve's leaking bad, but you probably die of something else. And I got in the car, and I received my first locution. I didn't know what a locution was until I read St. Teresa of Avila's book, The Interior Castle. It scared me. This voice clear as a day says, get to the Mayo Clinic now, it's the valve. Uh, it was so real that I got ran home and I called. And the Mayo got me in two weeks. They had my records. They go, you're in mitral valve failure. You're going to need open heart surgery within 24 months. Don't take that medicine. If you go into AFib, call us right away. So I went home and sure enough, I go back into AFib and I run back up. They do a specialized test, a transesophageal echo, and they said, wow. You got less than half the blood going through your body. The other half squirting up in your heart. You got to go to the surgeon. So I went from one doctor telling me I'm fine to the other guy say I'm at heart failure. That was hard to deal with. <clears throat> and I ended up uh, 57 and be 58 at the time. And so um, I'm driving home. The surgeon's appointments in 13 days for the consult. They said, you'll be fine. Just don't do anything strenuous. So I'm driving home and the Lord says, read the word. You will need this. So I said, I'll read Psalms because that's what Jesus quotes the most. I'll read Proverbs and I'll read the New Testament. And as I'm going through the Bible, I am literally Jim crying. I'm bawling like a baby. And my wife's saying, what's wrong with you? You love the Bible. Because the Lord kept saying to me, I suffered for you. You will suffer for me, but I'll be with you. And I'm like, remember, I had a charmed life. Now he's telling me suffering awaits me and my afflictions. And I began to have the battle of the self-will versus his will for me. That battle we all struggle with, and I'm, I'm living it. I haven't seen the surgeon yet. <clears throat> Psalm 51, whew, stick a knife in my back. Prayer, you know, of, of a sinner. Psalm 91, a prayer of a man in distress. But I kept coming back to Psalm 139. He knew me, and he loves me, he made me. I was clinging to that. So I go see the surgeon. And uh, he says, look, I can't fix your valve. Be prepared to come out with a metal valve in your chest. And I said, doc, I don't want that. Morbidity, mortality. He goes, I'm being honest with you. So I said to him, I said, look, can I pray over your hands? He's a stranger. He goes, what? Let him give me your hands. I said, Lord, you brought me to this man in my life for a reason. He's a stranger. But please, patience and the precision in his fingers to repair my valve because you gave him the gift in his hands of healing through the blood of the cross. Amen. He said, great. I, I went home, finished the, reading the Bible, and I'm really distressed because he kept telling me I would now suffer for him. And I began to go into heavy duty prayer. I got to the point of you will be done. You will be done. I'm probably going to die. He's telling me something would happen to me. But I said, Lord, whatever has to happen to me, I bring my, my family back to faith in the church. Many of our family left. And then at number two, I said, Lord, Matthew 9, 37, 38 really struck me. <clears throat> the harvest is great and the labors are few. Ask the master of the harvest to send you out into the labor fields. And I saw the actionable verb ask. I said, wait a minute, I got to ask. It ain't just going to happen. So I said, Lord, I'm asking. I can't negotiate with you. But if you let me live, I'll quit everything. I realize now that this world got in the way of my salvation, the salvation of my family, the salvation of my friends, and I, I'll, I'll leave it. I will walk away from it. I made the Lord a covenant. Careful what you ask for, he's about to answer your prayers. <laughs> so um, I end up, uh, uh, Beth sees me distressed in uh, the week before surgery. So I had like 10 days since the consult and the actual surgery. <clears throat> Beth buys me a crucifix. Says, hey, when we dated you had when you lost him, Take him for comfort. Again, there's no coincidences in life. There's only Christ incidences. 
Little did we know that this cross would journey. It's the story of our lives, the cross. So uh, Beth buys me the cross, and I thank her every day for it. We end up uh, going to, uh, I got anointed by the sick. Thanks be to God, I remembered that. Uh, Thursday before surgery. And I go in my Bible and the crucifix, and I'm out. And I said, let me say a prayer. I said, Romans 5, 3 through 5, perfect. For someone who's going to have afflictions and suffering where St. Paul says, rejoice in them. They'll build proven character. They'll give you hope. Hope will never disappoint because God's filled your heart with the love, the Holy Spirit that has been given to you. Yep, baptized, I'm out. So I wake up and the doctor goes, you did great. You're going to be out in six days. <laughs> Lord had a different plan for me. <clears throat> the next day was June 3rd, 2017, and two, about 2.10 p.m., my sister was at the foot of the bed. And I asked her to get the nurse because my whole body was like burning. I was like on fire. And uh, the nurse looked at all my vitals because I'm wired up in the ICU. And she said, he's fine, perfectly fine. Um, she walked out of the room. And she took two steps out of the room and I had a cardiac arrest. Not a heart attack, cardiac arrest, heart stops. And um, uh, my sister began to pray over me fervently. And uh, my soul separated from my body. And I know what I'm about to say is a private revelation. It has nothing to the deposit of faith. My soul left my body, and I watched him work on me. And I was total peace of looking at myself, recognizing the body from the soul's perspective. Then this glorious white light came. It was brighter than the sun. It was pure white. If you looked at the sun today, you'd burn your retinas. I didn't have retinas. It was more intense than the sun, the white light. And it just beckoned me. And I'm going to speak metaphysically because I didn't have a body. And I couldn't tell whether I was traveling into the light or was pulling me. The word I would use is absorption. And I go into this light and I fall down and I start worshiping God. Um, I knew he was the creator. I knew I was the creature. You can't put words on this, Jim. Um, God gave us words to try it in our finite intellect to, to articulate or explain our reason and our thoughts but you cannot describe God. So he's absolutely right when he said that. But he also said, then will I know as I am fully known. And I'd like to share with your listeners that I still had my intellect and I still had my free will, but they were heightened to a level that was beyond belief. I was more alive in heaven than I was here in the body on this radio show. But when you stand in the presence of he who is love himself, your listeners have no idea what awaits them. Um, when your soul is in union with its creator, there's an ardor of affection. I felt unconditional love. It doesn't exist here in this world. It's real. It's real. Other attributes I'd use or words to describe heaven is we communicated, but I didn't have vocal cords. I didn't have a resurrected body. Other things I would say is uh, there was no time or space there. So I don't know whether if I was there a millisecond or a thousand years. But he did show me my past. Some people call it illumination of conscience. He showed me everything I did that offended him all the way back. I had to live it again and see how I hurt other people <clears throat> by my willful actions. And it was frightening. And he said, you have to go back. Next thing I know, my eyes pop open. The doctors are standing over me screaming, say something. And I said, you used 150 joules on me, didn't you, doctor? And he goes, how did you know that? And they're in the book because the Mayo doctors had to interview me and sign off that book. <clears throat> it all happened. And the doctor said, he's back. We got him back. Little did we know, Jim, that the tumult had just begun. So the next day is Pentecost Sunday. Praise be Jesus Christ. And at 8.49 a.m., I'm talking to my wife and our son, David. <clears throat> and my eyes roll back in my head again, and I die again. Cardiac arrest. And Pentecost. And again, and again, and again. So um, she calls for our son, Michael, to get there. Um, and Michael walks in. The only thing I remember on Pentecost Sunday is Michael in my left ear saying, Dad, I'm here. I love you. And I tried as hard as I could to open my mouth and say, I love you too, son. I didn't, I, I didn't have the strength. 
And next thing I know, I have another cardiac arrest and Michael hadn't been in the room more than 15 seconds. <clears throat> so for some reason, only God knows, both of our children, my wife, my sister, my brother, all of my family had to literally watch me die from 10 to 15 feet away. They said it was horrific. And they would kept paddling me and electrocuting me. And finally, after about two hours of this, I had eight cardiac arrests on Pentecost Sunday. Love the number eight, rebirth. Um, <clears throat> they called me, basically said, we're sorry. What he has is fatal. He's lost the electrical connection to his heart. Uh, we can't keep electrocuting a human being like this. It's inhumane. Because they said, Dr. Shervatsen's here. He's the head of electrophysiology department. And if he wants to do anything, it's up to him, but we're done here. <clears throat> so the Lord moves our son Michael's heart to go into the, my room and take the last thing he's got left of his father, which is the cross that Beth bought. The Lord gives Michael a locution that says, get to St. Paul's church now, leave. Very direct. Michael knew it was real. Didn't know where the voice came from. But he said, my dad's name's Paul. So he had to literally Google it. He took off and he was in no condition to drive. So he goes to St. Paul's church, walks in the church. He thinks it's a priest. There's communion and confirmation going on. And the, and the man says, sir, that's not a priest. It's the bishop. Bishop Thomas Olmsted. And as we know, in um, James 5, 13, 16, are any of you sick? Go to the elder of the church, because the prayers of a righteous man are fervent at God's throne. So not knowing he was the bishop, <clears throat> the bishop, Michael got there right at the end of communion. The service is over. Bishop comes out. He runs up. Michael falls at his feet, lifts up the cross, and says, please, pray for my father now. Something happened at the hospital. He's dead. Bishop Olmstead later told Beth and I, I've never seen an act of faith like that in my life. His faith saved your life. It reminded me of the Roman centurion. Say the word. And we know bishops have the apostolic authority as Jesus gave them to raise the dead. It's documented. I'm not the only one. Bishop Olmstead said, Paul, when I clutched the cross that your son gave me, I had chrism on my hands. I felt the suffering. And I said, Michael, where two or more are gathered in, in his name there, I'll be in their midst. Let us pray for your father. So your, your son's faith touched my heart so much, I drove back to my private chapel, and I prayed for you all afternoon into the evening during my vespers for an anointing of the Holy Spirit to heal you in the name of Jesus Christ. And same if Michael were here, he'd say this. When I was done praying with Bishop Olmstead, I had this peace come over me that, Dad, whether you were dead or alive, or somewhere in between, it didn't matter. I had this peace over me. Little, We didn't know Bishop Olmstead that well. We've come to realize what a holy man he was. He was in the secretary's office for 10 years with John Paul II in Rome. He was Mother Teresa's interpreter. The man exudes the Holy Spirit while they're praying. So everything's timed at mail. Dr. Shravatsin asked my wife to rescind the do not resuscitate order, and they wheeled my body away. And he quickly went up my groin and he put a screw in lead in my ventr in ventricle. He went down my juggler, put a screw in lead in my atrium. And he did what's called a left stellate ganglion nerve block in my brainstem. He took a needle and he put right up into my ganglion nerve, your autonomous bodily nerve. So when you sleep at night, you breathe and your heart beats. Just the left side of the nerves, heart and lungs. And he anesthetizes it. Before he did, he showed us the, my chart later and he said, read this. Unable to proceed with interrogating the device and the wires. So I had a generator sewn in the side of my neck outside my body. She's so going to try to beat me artificially. He said, right here, you're going to go to the morgue because I can't test those wires because you don't have a heartbeat. The next sentence in my chart, and I give all glory to God, says, <clears throat> patient's heart returns to sinus rhythm on its own. We're standing around you going, what the heck just happened? Your heart came back. And I yelled, test the wires. And they work. They overrode your heartbeat. I took that needle, a six inch needle, went up into your brain area. I killed your heart and lungs, you can't, you, they can't work. I got you on a heart lung machine, you're in a coma. I worked on you with medication to get your heart normalized. It's all artificial. And I told your wife, look, he's alive by the wire in his neck. It's down in his heart. <laughs> yeah, I'm resting him. In two days we turned it off. If he, and we shut the wire off, 
if he, his heart stops, we leave him, he's dead again. If he lives, he's most likely going to have neurological problems because he's been dead too long without oxygen to his brain. I'll praise be Jesus Christ. Two days later, I'm up walking around the uh, ICU, a new creation, just praying over people dying. Um, it's been a very, I had to go through the crucible, Jim. I'll be that direct with you. Some of us have to go through the crucible and be tested and tried. And after this, I asked for the cross. Where's my cross? And the Lord said to me, thank your son, Michael, for his actionable faith. The prayers were heard. I'm like, huh? Michael never told anybody what he did. So I asked him, I said, where'd you take this? He said, I, it wasn't me, Dad. It wasn't me. And uh, I asked for it back. I clutched it. My remaining 11 days in the ICU, I just thought of Jesus. Like, Every heartbeat, every breath I have, every moment he gives me, they're his. I exist for him. And I would simply meditate on the cross. You know, as Fulton Sheen said, it's the autobiography of every man's life. You'll accept the cross for your own salvation, or you'll reject it for your own condemnation. And I didn't really understand that you really have to choose heaven on earth while you live. Um, I had put off death, like it was going to happen down the road. So um, I'm a miracle, like my mother. Um, I don't understand it. I will never understand it. Um, but I knew God. I knew that light. And again, as St. John writes very brilliantly, and we use words to try to communicate our thoughts. God is light. God is love. God is spirit. And God is the word made flesh, Jesus. So I did literally quit everything. People thought I was nuts. I could have made a ton of money the rest of my life in my businesses. I walked. Beth and I put that book in a charitable trust, so we give all the monies away. I, can't, I couldn't take a dime. My, my namesake, St. Paul, I won't take a dime to tell you what Jesus did for me and my family. And we donate the proceeds to the religious orders. Why? Because in St. Faustina's book, The Diary, they prayed for us. The religious orders pray for the church. There'll be a lot fewer souls in purgatory if it wasn't for the religious orders praying for the church. Archbishop Corleone, we, we became good friends and he's a theologian and he came over and he wanted to look at the medical records and ask me questions. Thanks be to God, you're talking about the sacraments and state of sanctifying grace. Thanks be to God, I received the anointing of the sick because I wasn't a big confession goer. But then I mentioned that I was burning the right before I died, my whole body was on fire. Archbishop Corleone said, what do you think that was? I said, I don't know. He said, you're being purged because you still had sin in you. You're, you're being purged. There was no scientific reason why you were burning because nothing unclean will ever get near God. I never thought about it that way. And um, so again, thanks. Thank, I, I may not even be talking to you if in fact I didn't go get the anointing of the sick. So, um, Anyway, the Lord will judge each of our hearts, and that was the best I could do. Mm -hmm. But trust me now, now that I know you live after you die, I'm literally walking on eggshells. I control my thoughts before they turn to thought of sin. Um, Sirach 736 says, In all you do, remember your last days, and you will never sin. Was that a helpful video for you? I sure hope so. That's why we do this show, to help real people get real results, advancing in the way, the truth, and the life that we're made for. It's called The Simple Truth. It's a radio program Monday through Friday, and we live stream it right here on this channel. Make sure to subscribe, like, and share if you would be so kind. And if you like that last video, here's another one I think you might get a lot out of.